Okay, hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Marta Calderaro and I'm going to uh, introduce this uh, within the first um, session, we would say, uh, the, uh, how, how to participate uh, within this webinar. Uh, the webinar is organized by uh, Picasso Project and uh, as you probably know, as you probably have seen, Picasso Pro Project is, uh, is uh, going to uh, reflect on EU and United States ICT collaboration in, in three technological uh, domains, 5G, Big Data, and IoT, and uh, cyber physical systems. Right now, we are going to talk about the uh, policy brief that was prepared by the policy expert group uh, chaired by uh, Mr. Martin Botterman, which is going to talk after me. Uh, on regards of the uh, ICT security issues that are going to affect uh, the EU-US ICT uh, collaboration. So, uh, as I was saying before, this webinar uh, is going to be an interactive webinar. So we are going to ask to you to comment uh, within the, the webinar and how you can do it. How can you comment? Uh, just before you can see that here from uh, the visual, you have the possibility to raise your hand and ask for uh, contribute to the discussion. Uh, whenever you are going to ask for uh, the contribution, uh, I'm going to uh, receive your request and I'm going to uh, able you to, to discuss within your own microphone. You can also use the chat uh, by asking the permission and I'm going to let you uh, uh, participate uh, also via chat. But uh, it's possible whenever you ask for your, uh, you raise your hands, you're going to see here there is the icon uh, regarding your microphone. The icon is going to uh, be green, has to be green, uh, so uh, we can hear you back and you will be able to contribute uh, to to our discussion. So uh, this is actually uh, the procedure on how to contribute uh, to the webinar, to the partic participatory webinar. And now I'm going to give the floor to uh, our first uh, main organizer of the webinar, Mr. Um, Martin Botterman. Uh, who is here and has Picasso, the chairman of the Picasso Policy Expert Group. So, Martin, can you talk to us? Thank you. Thank you, Marta Calderaro, uh, for your excellent uh, help in making all this possible. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, looking forward to engage in the next 90 minutes with you on uh, ICT security aspects, particularly about 5G networks, big data, and IoT CPS, and particularly in the framework of what we can do together as uh, researchers on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, so, after me, we'll have uh, contributions from uh, Mr. Dave Farber, uh, 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 Doctor at the, um, the Carnegie Mellon University with a long-standing uh, career in ICT, internet, and security, um, and uh, he will share uh, his perspective from a technical uh, view on how uh, things came to be and how to think about that. Uh, Dr. Jonathan K from Work uh, will uh, explain the policy uh, aspects relating to that. The social social aspects that uh, relate to uh, ICT security, which is, as you all know, not only a technical problem, but really a problem like also how we deal with it. So, um, after these two presentations, I'll uh, allow you to, to uh, ask questions for clarification. 
um, and uh, any discussion on on the general uh, aspects. Uh, before we go, we dive deep into uh, what this means from a 5G perspective, uh, for which uh, Ms. Janning Zhu will, will speak. Um, on the big data perspective, uh, for which uh, uh, we hope uh, Mr. Nick Gossaris uh, will join us soon. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, we're still chasing him. Um, and uh, Christian Sontag uh, will finalize the, the, the discussion with uh, a view on IoT uh, and in particular the cyber physical systems uh, aspect of that. So not so much the individual things like bracelets, uh, um, uh, light bulbs whatsoever, but more the entire systems uh, that make use of IoT and interact. So, uh, with each of these discussions, we'll also uh, stop uh, for questions and interactions, remarks, um, uh, additions, feedback, and uh, etc. So, with that, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the context. Uh, uh, this is a webinar is organized by the Project Picasso. Um, it's a coordination and support action funded by the European Commission, uh, DG Connect. Uh, it is over a period of two and a half years, and it uh, is really to bring multiple stakeholders together that are involved in ICT research and innovation uh, in the European Union and in the USA. Uh, the key message is really that a collaboration between EU and US in uh, uh, research and innovation can help to reflect socio-economic and technological realities and can help to improve the contribution of ICT development and policy to enhancing economic growth and, and all the needs uh, from both industrial and from societal perspective. It's really at the heart of the EU policy orientations with that task. Uh, the digital single market will, will be a strategy will not be uh, new for many of you. Uh, it's to, at the core of how uh, Europe thinks that uh, the digitizing society uh, needs to be approached and, and can be uh, used for the benefit of society. So, the organization of the project is basically that we have four expert groups. A specific expert group on 5G networks with leading researchers in that area, uh, in uh, big data and in uh, IoT, CPS. And a fourth expert group which looks at the embedding policy issues. Not at all policy issues as such, but really those policy issues that relate to uh, the three uh, specific technical uh, subjects. We've already produced a paper on privacy and data protection, which you can find online. And uh, after finalizing uh, the security and ICT paper, we'll also work on the standards aspect relating to those three subjects. So we've seen these slides. So where are we today? Obviously, there I, we, we have to mention uh, WannaCry, uh, which is currently still playing. Uh, we see that vulnerabilities like WannaCry, but also uh, uh, that that that's, that comes with ransomware uh, uh, using vulnerabilities in the networks. Um, but also the cyber attack, uh, the DDoS attack uh, for which Internet of Things objects were used uh, at the end of last year. Uh, and also the, the many uh, breaches of uh, security of, of multiple uh, uh, user addresses and data uh, like Yahoo, but uh, Yahoo is mentioned here because it was big and at the end of 2016. Uh, it's not the only one. Uh, there's many ways in which uh, you, your data can have been compromised over the years uh, because of uh, breaches. Uh, welcome, Nikos. 
very good to have you on board as well. It means all the speakers are here. So security is high on the agenda. Um, the nice thing is that we all become more aware of uh, the vulnerabilities that have always been there and that are there and now working out. Um, there's no magic cure and uh, that is because uh, every cure we have also sets the stage for new set of issues. They will go deeper into that. The challenges for sure are global. Uh, this cannot be seen in isolation. Uh, security can be breached from anywhere in the world and uh, equipment and services are really used all over the world. So uh, it's very important to see this in global context. Uh, I'm here today at the One conference, which is focused on cyber security issues in, in, in Europe. And there, uh, the, the real question is also like, if in Europe as one block, alone uh, obviously will need to place this in global context uh, again very well demonstrated by the the ransomware wanna cry uh, breach so it's also clear it requires acting in every step of the value chain by all stakeholders uh, both designers uh, businesses governments and end users and that aspect will be uh, gone in deeper by uh, Jonathan so, having said that, I'd like to give the floor to Dave. Uh, Dave, do you have control over the slides or do I need to push the slides for you? Uh, I'd probably appreciate pushing the slides for me. No, I, I can do it from here. Okay. Um, you find them on the left bottom. Excellent. Okay. Everybody can hear me? Just for sound check. I can hear yeah. you. I, I close my mic. Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk about the current situation in the security area. The uh, where we are now is a reflection of how we got there, and uh, it's worth remembering that the whole underpinning technology of our uh, cyberspace, our internet, etc., is a result of a series of experiments, a series of building uh, systems, elaborating those systems, putting in new applications, elaborating those, etc., adding new features. Uh, two things that went along with that, as as we elaborated the features of the uh, of the underlying systems, we've also seen a tremendous increase in both the computing power that supports it and the communication uh, technology that intertwines it. Now, those things are usually good, but they do give an opportunity for mischief. Um, also, the uh, the environment that we're currently operating in, I'd characterize as extremely vulnerable. We have two basic operating systems that uh, that underlie at least the European and, America and North American uh, environments, and that's Windows and uh, Apple's environments. The, if you'll notice, just the result of that, for many, many times, security issues arose in Windows because it was the dominant uh, operating system. As Apple's systems became more attractive and had a larger audience, they too uh, had security problems. Part of that is uh, that basically there are very, very large pieces of software and things that we've learned over 40, 50 years in building large operating systems in particular is that it is very difficult to control the security of it, especially given that you didn't have that as a primary requirement when you started. It's always difficult to add security to existing systems. You sort of tend to patch a problem and patching that problem in, induces the visibility of several other problems that are a result of that. So you're constantly 
in there trying to fix things and producing more problems. The fact that uh, the internet has tied together many, many things, and if you look at the environment out there, it, you have versions of software and hardware that uh, date back almost to ancient history, as well as very modern systems that do have some uh, major security components built into it, especially in the hardware side of the house. But that mix and the fact that they're all connected has caused us many of the problems that we see now. Uh, that's a particular problem in things like IoT and uh, many of our appliances, uh, routers, etc., which have in them code that is quite often 20, 25 years old, uh, has been maintained in a long time. Uh, when somebody's going to build a new comp, a new system, especially IoT or routers, they pick up some software uh, that they think works and they plug it in. Uh, they certainly don't develop the underlying operating uh, and network software on their own. So, in fact, we have a lot of, lot of problems there, and it's just going to get worse in the future. Uh, the over-the-air maintenance of it has done us a world of good in some ways. On the other hand, it produces some vulnerabilities that we still really don't completely understand. Uh, we count on the fact that people who maintain software, we trust. Uh, when we put a new application or a, a fix to an application, we sort of assume that that's a trustworthy thing. But again, uh, if I look at the underlying hardware that these things run on in general, there are a lot of holes. It's very, very difficult to protect uh, soft, the operating system against applications that are, are bad. Uh, we're getting better at it, but we're getting better slower than people are taking advantage of the holes that are there. I already mentioned the the IoT problem that's going to face us in the future, and it's facing us now. We've had some improvements. It would be silly not to, to say we didn't. Uh, some of them are um, help us in getting increased um, uh, capabilities, uh, things like software, the endless variety of uh, software-defined networks has given us some added flexibility. Uh, but still, under, underpinning this is still the same old uh, communication structure that's been uh, evolved and patched and uh, uh, shows, shows its age, basically, uh, both in even the current version is more or less the fact that we're dealing with rather ancient systems that are still connected and still uh, are vulnerable. Uh, I would like to sort of suggest that we're at a point now where we're, especially in critical systems, we're no longer capable of just sort of patching our way to safety. We have systems now that depend on computer control, network-oriented computer control, uh, power, uh, I could go on forever naming them. And it's not clear that we, financial, etc. it's not clear that we can protect these by just continuing to patch. And I would argue and have argued that it's time to sit back and take a look at all the research work, uh, worldwide research work that's done in building secure hardware, secure operating systems, and secure network technology and see if we can not sort of harvest that to produce a next generation of both devices, software, and networking technology. Now, I completely understand that it is very difficult to replace the hundreds of millions of computers out there, but it, it potentially is possible to take very isolated application areas, for instance, power management, uh, parts of financial industry, parts of uh, water systems, which turn out to be rather vulnerable also. And to put in place of what we have there, much more robust, much more safe systems, and then hope that as time goes on, the commercial sector, the, the home sector will pick this up. 
uh, initially we may have to run isolated systems for that reason. But it's clear that, at least it's clear that we're not getting ahead of the power curve. Uh, we're seeing more and more attacks. The attacks are very successful. Uh, and there's good reason to believe that that's not going to slow down unless we make it extremely difficult to do those attacks. The only way to do that is to really undertake a fairly massive uh, research effort to see just how good a system we can put together based on knowledge from the past and based on good research that can be done in that area. Uh, I could spend a lot more time on that, but I think that's about what I want to say. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, for this uh, clear introduction, uh, just echoing that uh, part of these issues have come up here in the Hague this, today as well. Um, and, and, and one of the remarks that was made is that, uh, yes, a lot to learn, but further to strengthen Dave's uh, uh, argument, also something needs to happen. And what was pointed out when WannaCry was uh, discussed here was that CryptoLocker uh, which was a couple of years ago, where everybody was shocked and then uh, went back to sleep in, in some ways or another. Anyway, thank you for setting that scene. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I would like to give you the floor to follow up and dive deeper in the policy side, after which uh, I will allow the first round of questions. Uh, and please feel free to uh, indicate in the chat what question you want to ask or raise your hands uh, after Jonathan has spoken. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you, Dave, for that nice introduction. Um, please forgive me if I suddenly disappear. My network here is not the most reliable, and I've reconnected three times to get to this point. Um, everything that Dave said about the nature of systems that have been patched and bodged and added to over time and therefore develop leaks and creaks of different forms is true in spades of both the policy environment and the human economic and other systems that the policy environment seeks to support and facilitate. Um, one of the things that we learned just before I go into the, the main bit of it from the WannaCry episode, particularly from the UK perspective, where the National Health Service was particularly hard hit, was the subtle ways in which technological knowledge interfaces with, uh, let's say, commercial, political, and uh, policy realities. The National Health Service has been under severe budget pressure. And at the same time, there have been many, many initiatives to try to automate it. One consequence is the survival within that system in mission critical roles of a lot of legacy software like Windows XP that is particularly vulnerable. Now, of course, everybody knows about these vulnerabilities, has known for some time. So the question arises, why haven't they been fixed? One part is, of course, the same thing that leads to their survival. It costs money and it costs time, and that time may have a higher opportunity cost even than the money. The other one is that the demands on the system are so high and so continuing this being a critical infrastructure uh, and superstructure of society, that it's not possible to simply make patches and replace bits of software. Because when you do that, this complex interacting system will suffer losses of functionality, which in this case would mean death. And so people haven't really been able to do much more than to fix the most obvious leaks. Now, there's a particular problem for policymakers because when these things become critical, it's to the policymakers that people turn and on whom they try to put responsibility. But cybersecurity risks in particular are Jonathan, I think that we have he has. A not the end, He's, he'll have to reconnect. Yes. <laughs> OK. Do you want Dave to, to help them or Martin? 
I'm just checking. Uh, Jonathan still seems to be online. I'll, I'll double check with him uh, quickly. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah. Yes, I am back again. Sorry, it went <laughs> off. I was trying to, I think it went off because of my network. I was trying to return briefly to the previous slide, but I don't seem to have control of the slides. Um, nope. Ah, there we go. Okay, yeah, no, no, carry on one, please. That's it. Um, and the thing about cybersecurity is also that its risk could be, you know, you could try to have as an objective that you could minimize it, but as a single actor in the system, that's probably not a meaningful to do, thing to do because the risk depends on what everybody does. In much the same way, trust in the system you could try to maximize it, but that increases dependency on the system, which as we've seen from the WannaCry NHS example, may not also be a good thing to do. You need both the system operators and all the people who use the system to take some appropriate responsibility for what happens. And finally, trust and security can be measured in particular ways and they're managed to those measurements. But in many cases, it's people's expectations or beliefs about trust and security that are the most important things. And uh, if we can go on now to the next slide, please. Uh, we've identified a couple of interesting domains of policy development that might be worth discussion and are obviously covered in, in more detail in the policy brief. The first thing is that there's a close connection between ICT security and data and the changing ways in which data are used. That's not merely a matter of privacy or information security in the classic sense, because these, it's the ways in which these data are processed and interpreted and the responses, both human and automatic, of our world to those flows of data that determine the outcomes with which we are concerned. It's one thing to have a data breach. Uh, for example, the Mount, Go Mount Gox data breach in the Bitcoin world has a shadow even to these, this day. But having real consequences like uh, canceling operations and so on is something else. Now, you can't understand or address it except in the ICT plane, but the impacts and the evaluation of what you could do can't be solely undertaken within that plane. Now, obviously, the elements underpinning our use of data are also coming under attack. A lot of the information on which we rely may be fake. The algorithms that process it may be compromised, and it may not be quite so obvious how to detect these things uh, at a reliable and trustworthy level. And so the degree of insecurity uh, may spread, and it may become much more serious. Now, policy and rules can help to set the ground rules, but they can't exactly control human behavior. So in addition to the technical research uh, for which Dave called, I would say that this research and innovation agenda, this shared research and innovation agenda, will need necessarily to take into account human behavior. And it is still the case that just as people with technical systems try to patch up those systems, people with legal systems try to patch up the laws. And the internet readiness of our laws and regulation and the legal compliance aspects of our technical and other forms of internet-based systems are still not in close alignment. They still don't necessarily avoid working across purposes. And the other thing to mention in this domain is that there is a kind of security sector. And the security sector is used to thinking in terms of defenders and adversaries. And since the risks may emerge not from any intentional behavior or from any behavior that an individual can control or is responsible for, that zero-sum sort of thinking may not be the best place from which to start our research, and some of what we have done may need to be rethought. One element of this concerns the identification of individuals. As you may know, the thing that stopped the spread, one of the things that contributed to stopping the spread of WannaCry was being able to own the domain that all of the infected systems attempted to contact. And through that, to begin to identify the flow of this thing through the system and possibly even to trace it back, but that hasn't happened yet. Now, when we have methods of identifying people online, 
if I can verify their identity, the identity of a person who logs into a service, I can then hold them responsible for what they do. But it may not be useful to hold them responsible for things that they can't themselves control. By doing so, however, I can possibly shift liability. We have missed him another time, I think. Yes. Um, he was very quickly back uh, earlier. Um, just to make uh, the point uh, very clear that uh, the whole liability shifting, uh, the uh, clarity in liability was also here in The Hague, uh, an important subject. Uh, increasing uh, transparency to fix market failures and uh, come to uh, insurance uh, ability and uh, liability uh, clearly allocating to people that uh, should take responsibility uh, is seen as one of okay, the... Okay, yeah, uh, I, sorry. Sorry, I'm back again. Um, yes, uh, I, get, I get the point that you have now carried me on to uh, why it is that we haven't agreed to universal identification. Uh, one of the reasons being that we don't trust some of the people uh, who hope to identify us in the right way. We already have lots of identification, but it's not personal, and it's people's behavior that we're concerned with. And many of the other forms are not working as well in the scale and scope and speed of the internet as we have it today. Uh, in particular, passwords. I don't know about you, but I've got many, many passwords. I lock them all up in another piece of software. When that thing goes down, I'm sort of uh, uh, out of luck. And just because I'm a finite human being, many of the passwords are not as mutually secure as they might be. And even if we have strong identification, as long as you can create virtual identities online, you can have as many of them as you like. Uh, you may not be able to escape your past ones. On the other hand, you may not be able to use your past ones terribly well. Okay, if we could go on, please. Uh, could we advance the slide? Oh, thank you. Um, two final things. One of them has to do with the fact that data processing and algorithmic uh, treatment of data have introduced a series of challenges which are now beginning to have an implication for policy and an impact on policy. On the one hand, if we are using data, we need to know that those data are accurate and can be relied on at least for the purposes that we're using them for. Part of this might have to do with audit. And so when we think about automated decisions, for example, some of the proposals are that there should be legal requirements that all of the source code of algorithms should be publicly auditable. However, these algorithms interact with each other, and it may not be possible adequately to understand their behavior simply by looking at the source code and not being able to take account either of the history of data that have brought that algorithm to its particular manifestation or to be able to have a look at its interactions with other ones. On the extreme far side are sort of trustless systems like distributed ledgers, uh, digital autonomous organizations, smart contracts, and other blockchain type effects, which don't require um, a single source of authority and therefore don't have a single source of failure, but have their own difficulties in particular with repudiation should some part of the chain of transactions or chain of entries into the ledger become compromised. Now, on the legal front, we're beginning to see some signs of this. The, the earliest uses of those distributed ledger technologies Okay, this is uh, annoying. It's good to see that most of us are able to stay online the whole time. Uh, the, the point uh, Jonathan is making is that, that really the way we deal with data is, is, is uh, changing and, and new alternatives are coming up. 
that are demonstrated by uh, real practice. Um, and also uh, upcoming is uh, cybercrime uh, and attention for that much more. Uh, and this puts extra challenges to the infrastructure that uh, we were suffering from uh, already. Uh, Jonathan, can you continue with cybercrime and move towards Randolph? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm now reconnected again. Um, yes, on the cybercrime, both the EU and the US have many, many laws and legal instruments, statutory instruments and agreements that define certain activities as cyber criminal activity. Now, the focus has naturally been on new types of crime that have a specific cyber element. There's been some backfilling to try to adapt existing laws on crime, for example, fraud and hate speech and so on, for their cyber specific manifestations. Uh, I mentioned in the slides and we discuss in the brief many, many more examples of these. One of the interesting things, however, is the fact that there are very close interactions among the different types of legislation within each one of these domains, within the EU and within the US. Within the EU, there's the European Cybercrime Center, which sort of sits atop all of these instruments and is capable not only of jointly implementing them, but of collecting information and providing a platform for research to help us understand better how the laws that we pass may affect an internet that they cannot control. In the United States, much more of this until recently has taken the form of computer crime enhancements to existing legislation and a lot of litigation. But just recently, there's the new cybersecurity executive order with, without being, with which, without being political, I can say does constitute an interesting uh, first start, though we may discuss this. Um, and I think ultimately we're going to have to adapt our thinking in policy to take into account how these new technologies change, not just the laws themselves, but the practices of law enforcement. Some existing crimes are facilitated by the existence of these ICT approaches. This may make it harder or easier to collect and analyze evidence. It may also motivate laws like the Investigatory Powers Act in the UK, which seek to collect evidence, but unlock a lot of other um, Pandora's boxes besides. And one final thing I'll mention is the fact that a lot of the things that facilitate e-commerce of various forms also facilitate payment and transaction services to criminal enterprises, as witnessed by the use of Bitcoin for the WannaCry exploit. Okay, I've managed to drag to an end, so I will now turn it over to discussion. Hopefully I'll be here to hear the questions. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, allowing the, the first questions on the general framework. Uh, Avery uh, has a question, how big a role does the instance by government policymakers make on backdoors for uh, law enforcement agencies have to prevent trust in systems? It's funny, this, this question also came up in The Hague this morning, where uh, somebody from the Dutch National Intelligence uh, uh, was asked that question, and actually uh, he referred to that it was asked in Parliament last week as well, and that uh, following policy in the Netherlands, uh, he will not uh, exploit that uh, very much, but he has to find his way too. So it was not a very clear answer, just that it has the political democratic uh, interest, and, and, and the last word hasn't been said about it. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I think this is more political than a, a question yeah, for I, Dave. I, I was going to volunteer to take a first crack at it anyway because my time is somewhat limited. Um, there are several dimensions to this I'd like to draw out. First of all, it's not necessarily the case that the lack of trust in the system derives from the fact that people don't trust their own governments. They may not trust other governments which have access to the systems, and in this respect, I will mention the five I's and the 14 I's, that's E-Y-E-S, which everybody should go and read up about. The other thing is that the existence of a backdoor for 
let's call them good guys, which is today's good guys for today's good purposes, does not take away from the fact that the back door now exists. And the role of the NSA disclosures of certain vulnerabilities in the Windows system to opening the door for a hack which may or may not have originated in North Korea, but nonetheless uses a vulnerability which is which they may well have learned about from public authorities or which may have been put there by public authorities, uh, may have a damaging effect. And the final thing I'll mention is that when we have applications and service providers whose business proposition and whose leverage enable in being able to affect the security environment stems from the fact that they promise end-to-end -end security to their users, such as WhatsApp or iPhone or things like that, that legally preventing them from offering that security to their citizens may simply displace the activity with which we are concerned into channels where there is no access or possibly only prosecutorial or forensic access once an offense has been committed and not necessarily the kind of, let's say, predpol access to information that would help us to identify patterns of behavior with which we ought to be concerned, um, which wouldn't necessarily compromise privacy. But this is sort of a, an easy answer to a hard problem that potentially creates a lot of damaging concerns. Thanks, Dave. Uh, would you want to comment on this too? Yeah, uh, ideas like this or proposals like this are obviously not new. This is about the fifth iteration. Uh, for those who have a long memory, uh, Clipperchip proposal, which was to provide a, a backdoor into encryption systems, uh, it engendered a uh, fairly deep study on the part of the a set of computer science people. And the bottom line result is that you probably made the system more vulnerable, uh, considerably more vulnerable, because once, as does this and once you have a back door, it's naive to assume that only the good guys will find the back door. Uh, you have you have to understand that back doors can be found by anybody with sufficient uh, training and, and intelligence. And uh, that's been demonstrated time and time again. Very, very dangerous to put in back doors into stuff. We have enough, uh, if you want, accidental backdoors as is to put intentional ones in it's just incredibly dangerous thank you very much i i, I think the message for for us uh, researchers and developers is that we need to take this into account also that uh, the, the yeah, law enforcement continues to have a dilemma uh, between being able to perp uh, catch perpetrators and 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 uh, deal with vulnerabilities, um, this goes for vulnerabilities in the system and I guess for cryptography as well. Um, so for us, good to know and to take to into account that uh, this is an ongoing issue and we need to deal with this from our perspectives as well. Um, with that, um, I would like to move forward towards the first of the three more technical presentations for 5G. Uh, the perspective uh, I asked my colleagues to, to, to look at is so, if you look from your perspective to ICT security, uh, how do you contribute to making the world more secure and what new dangers uh, are coming up uh, for you? Uh, be, that, that need to be dealt with. So with that, uh, Ms. Yanning Zhu, can I give you the word? Uh, please talk a bit okay. louder. You're very <laughs> soft you at the moment. This is okay, great. Um, yes, and um, thanks for the very interesting and insightful presentation and uh, um, from Dave and uh, Jonathan. So here, um, as the first, we, 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 we want to discuss and uh, share some perspectives we have about the 5G related to the cybersecurity issue. 
So in order to understand this problem uh, or related issue, so we first recap what is 5D. Uh, please, please talk closer to your microphone. If uh, you, uh, you, after what is 5G, you became not hearable. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, better. Wait, better. I'm just trying to. Uh, is it better? Yes, it's yes. better. Okay, yeah. great. And not anymore. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you changed, but uh, now you were not uh, uh, understandable anymore. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. trying to mute you, Martin, in order to let Yanning uh, talk, okay? Yeah. And can you hear now? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. So, Please try to talk uh, within the microphone. Okay. Because it's really it's really low. You can um, also okay. So can you try? Yes. Right now, yes. Um. Hello? How about now? Yes, right now it's perfect. Okay, um, I'm very sorry for this. So basically 5G will be a key enabler for the network society. And the timeline is 2020. Um, when we talk about 5G, we have to think about the evolution from 2G to 4G. And the 5G from 2G and 4G, the mobile network is mostly a single domain radio access network. But in 5G, it will be the integration of cross-domain networks. It will include many vertical industries such as automotive, in the, uh, automation, health, energy. So from technical point of view, the traditional KPI throughput Coverage and mobility are not enough. We have to also consider the number of connections, latencies, and reliabilities. At the moment, there are lots of research and investment activities uh, all over the world, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia. So the main focus uh, are on technology components like uh, meter wave, um, massive MIMO, uh, net, uh, network uh, function virtualization, and also there's a lot of the test-based trials carried out in, in Europe and the US and Asia. And also from policy making point of view, there's also a lot of spectral allocation activities in EU, US. For example, um, for example, it's uh, it's already recognized that. Below one gigahertz, it will be targeting for coverage, and from one to six gigahertz, gigahertz it will focus on um, innovative uh, service. Uh, above six gigahertz, will focus on extreme mobile um, broadband, and the, for the one most important standardization organization in mobile network is 3GPP. Uh, for the end of uh, um, 2005, uh, 2000, sorry, 2015, uh, and beginning of 2018, uh, 3PP has launched many study items for understanding the requirements for 5G and in release 15, uh, which will start in the middle of this year. So very soon, it, uh, this release will address the first specifications for 5G. So this is the general background. Oh, sorry. 
So before we look at the, the future of 5G, we first look, at, look, look back to the uh, past from 2G to 4G. In the past, we have to say that uh, the mobile network is relatively safe. The main function is just the data or voice transmission. Each UE or device can be identified with a SIM card. So it only provides basic connectivity service. So the, the model is very is relatively simple. One user with two operators, one at home, one is roaming. And the evolution from 2G, 4G to 4G mostly focused on increasing data rates, increasing capacity, increasing coverage. Um, but as we discussed in previous slide, 5G is not a single domain network anymore. It will be a multiple domain network. It will impose great uh, challenges on security aspects. So first, at the device level, there will be a large unprecedented number of devices connected. And those devices are not just a phone, smartphone feature phone. There will be uh, IoT nodes, sensors. So, which means um, in the network there are devices with totally different capabilities. So, in this sense, if only one network connects everything, the low cost device, uh, which has very low security capacity might endanger the network as a whole. And in 5G, as we discussed before, that it's not just about basic connectivity service. It's also about the machine control, car to car communication. At the device level, there is lots of API different requirements. So a lot of different kinds of requirements. So for example, a week it may require different latency, different reliability. So this this might correspond to different security solutions. So at the network level, as five, one important uh, feature of 5G, which is different than previous evolution, is that this will be a wide range of vertical industry involved. They will have very diverse security requirements, as each industry may ha might have very different application requirements. That hasn't been the major concern in the previous evolution. For example, for industry automation, uh, it is very high priority that the radio access will not be jammed uh, by a by signal from unwanted transmitter, which is not basically not the major concern in the current system. Um, also, uh, as a vertical concept considered, most likely many services will be served by multiple oper operators from different domains. So telecom operator will not be the only one there. So this will be lots of Different domain uh, combined, so this can be very. This requires a new security mechanism, and to ensure this work smoothly. And we want to emphasize also things in the 5G network that some will also consider this critical infrastructure like power grid. It will require very high protection. Um, this is uh, the first. Then um, another um, issue is that when we can consider the technique components of 5G, um, this one important trend that to reduce uh, cost and speed up employment optimization um, speed. There's a uh, definite trend to decouple software and half, uh, hardware. So this means that we will rely on more software security than um, hard, um, security measure on use on hardware. 
uh, dedicated hardware. This can be very challenging. Uh, uh, also, as for example, network function virtualization is deployed, multiple operators will all work on the same entity. So this needs a definitely some separation between operators. And uh, also, there's a lot of virtualized domain that the security has to be done across different domains. So other than device and networking levels, we also need to think about the general privacy of the data. So as we mentioned before that uh, in two, from 2G to 4G, mostly we are the, the you and the user of networks are human, we are people. But in 5G, the, the network end will be can be human, can be machine, can be cars, can be many things. How can we manage the different identities? Should we give different priorities, different access? Another thing is that since 5G is just is a cross-domain network, means it will connect and transmit lots of data. Not just about you, about mobile phone, what you have now nowadays. It will be also uh, industry, data from industry, uh, from cars, from all, all the possible corners, then the question will be who will own the data and who can see the data. This is uh, quite important, I think, for security and privacy and to have a trust in the society. And uh, last, when we think about uh, all those issues, we have to also think about the cost and energy consumption. And in general, the more, I think the uh, sum of rule is that the higher cost you can put, of course, you can have a better chance to have better security. But uh, we want to build 5G for a viable and a sustainable business. So it means we have to take into account when we build the security mechanism and the framework. And the last, as mentioned the previous by uh, Jonathan, I think, that because before from 2 to 4G networks, the, the major issue is major issue is, is data connections, voice. But in future 5G, we will have many, many elements here, a lot of data, lots of infrastructures. So it is a very um, attractive target to be attacked. So which means that if there is some ill uh, intention of the individuals, organization, they might be interested to invest more than now to find a solution to attack the network. So what can 5G offer is a um, current one important uh, component in 5G is called network slicing. So basically it allows multiple logic networks to be created on top of a common shared physical in infrastructure. So in this sense that it can differentiate the security services. So for each logic network, they can be associated with different security level or characteristics. And uh, for each vertical industry, for different applications, they can also associate to different logic networks and uh, hence different uh, security characteristics. In this sense, security can be viewed as a, a value added service. Also, it's important that it can provide certain isolation between different logic networks. And the interactions of different logic, logic network, networks can be designed based on the required security level. Um, so, of course, I still want to say that for critical infrastructures, there might be some uh, high level of measures to be done so that to make sure that other cannot accept and uh, access this infrastructure 
from some other network. So, and last about the perspective. So, um, to ensure the success of the 5G network and this uh, network society, um, this is research has to be done in both policy domain and technology domain. As essentially the, the big challenge in 5G security is about the transition from a single domain network to a cross domain network. It has to be done in a top down approach and invite some innovations on the security architectures and concepts. So, uh, as said before, that is, this is a global issue that the definitely the, the, the collaboration between the EU and the US will be very important. So, this is what I have for today. And And come to take question. Um, and uh, thank you for that uh, clear presentation. And uh, it's clear that 5G is really a game changer as compared to the networks we had earlier. It's also clear it's not there yet, uh, but well on its way. Uh, I had a question from Dave Romero in the in the chat, David Romero. He said, do we need to have one single network for the internet of everything? Some discussion forums are saying that 4G LTE will be for people and 5G for, for things. Uh, you have a comment for that? And, and by the way, uh, uh, if you want to interact, follow up on these questions, uh, David, uh, on the answer, please, please let us know. We can also give you a mic. <coughs> okay, uh, Janine, what do you think of that question? Uh, yes, um, it is true that in 5G it will be uh, 5G for things, all the things are connected. So, but uh, how this is done, it is still need a discussion. I, I think it is something still under development, as I showed before in the slide. At the moment, the most development in 5G is about this uh, still very technique components. Um, so if um, <clears throat> uh, I think it is uh, very important to take those aspects into account. Um, so in this sense, I think a policy maker ha has to play a role um, to think ahead because 5G is going to provide infrastructure for a great network, including almost everything if they want. But uh, on the other hand, something has to be think ahead. Yes. But everything is still under development. Okay, thank you. It, uh, I think uh, that's also on the who will control the security levels, right? Government or industry decision. Uh, mm. I guess industry will have to take its own responsibility knowing that government is different government in different countries and industry will develop for the world. Yes. So, uh, Stephen, if you want to f uh, uh, follow up on that, please raise your hand and you'll get a mic. Um, But it's uh, the thing that we're developing all this in a global framework uh, where uh, industry delivers for all over the world and uh, governments have jurisdiction in their own country and interact with other governments. Uh, Stephen raised his hand, so you have the microphone, Stephen, please speak. Stephen, can you please also uh, try to talk? Okay, uh, the microphone has to be green. Microphone, yes. Icon. Uh, that's above uh, perspectives. Left upper corner is a microphone that should be green, Stephen, if you talk. 
Otherwise, you click on it and then it connects you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, it, it's an interesting moment. Government, um, they find it very difficult to agree. And when you get can you speak to closer them, to the microphone? Your microphone is very soft. It, it's interesting with governments that um, very few of them agree with each other. And when you get very unhelpful comments from, say, the US, where the NSA feel they should be back doors, uh, and, and the UK government does the same, um, that people can trust. I'm very much encouraged that the industry should take control and put in place a platform which is inherently secure. Obviously, um, what's put on that platform uh, can become insecure, but if the actual infrastructure itself cannot be tampered with, um, that, that's a good starting point. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, if any of the speakers wants to react on that, you can raise your hand too. Um, uh, it's a general uh, question and, and uh, it's, it's a very good question, but this is also why uh, I think one of the reasons why we, uh, it's clear that governments alone cannot take care of this because uh, the, the global framework uh, uh, between governments with their own jurisdictions is limited and slow in development and the industry tries to serve the world rather than just their own niche market. So it's a very good question and it's one of the questions we, we keep on the table. Um, with that, uh, Nikos, uh, I'd like to move towards you, uh, knowing that uh, this same uh, challenge that uh, uh, Stephen just expressed is also true for data. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please keep it to 15 minutes, uh, uh, including uh, some space for questions. Uh, aim is to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, have twice 15 minutes, so be ready about 10 past or 22 to the, the hour. So please go ahead. Sure, sure Martin. Can you, can, you, can you hear me well? Excellent. Can you hear me well, Martin? I can hear you excellent, Nikos. Okay, all right. Um, so, hello from me as well. I will talk a little bit about how important cybersecurity is uh, in uh, big data. Uh, before starting, let me say a few words about what we consider, when we consider data to be big. A data set is considered big when one or more of its attributes is uh, exceeds the usual expectations and uh, what kind of attributes are we talking about? Uh, many of you may have heard the famous uh, V's, uh, volume, variety, velocity, value. There are many V's that uh, have been phrased, have been defined as uh, attributes uh, for big data. So, um, for example, volume, the obvious one, when uh, the volume of a data set exceeds the usual expectations, consider directories, huge directories, let's say directory of all inhabitants in a, of a country, and with all their properties and information that uh, can be considered a big uh, data set in terms of volume. Uh, velocity, something data that is changing uh, very rapidly, uh, consider, for example, mobile calls around the universe, all with the, with the data, with everything that is being said in these uh, mobile calls. Uh, value is another, uh, another attribute. Uh, think about financial transactions, for example, that are happening all over the country or the world. Then uh, variety, another one. So think of uh, combined data sets of all the previous uh, examples. So data sets that have uh, different types of uh, um, attributes and different types of uh, data in, inside that need to be handled in a different way. And veracity is another example. Veracity is uh, the trustworthiness of, uh, of data. So for example, imagine what uh, everyone says that is happening, the famous uh, fake news problem that is going uh, around the world. This is again a, a big data set if you consider, for example, uh, what is being said around uh, Twitter. So all these, if a data set, data set doesn't have to be huge in all these attributes, it may be in one or more. And there are plenty of examples, as you can understand, that uh, 
data sets that are available now are uh, huge and cannot be handled by the current uh, IT infrastructure. And this is when the threat uh, comes in. Many say that data is the new oil in, our, in, the, in the days that uh, we, are, we are living. And uh, as data is uh, the main element of uh, systems and applications, in uh, big data applications, if the data security is not very, very, very well ensured, then the integrity of the entire industry is uh, jeopardized, as, as you can understand. With these huge data sets, with big data, comes large responsibility, and with it comes come huge uh, security problems. Uh, the problems are in two, uh, uh, two places, two, two, two facets. Uh, data that is born in uh, big data applications, so when an application it, it generates a uh, new, new data set, it has to make sure that this data is uh, only visible to authorized users and uh, authorized uh, processes, and that uh, only those users and those processes that uh, should, uh, should be able to, to change uh, the values in this uh, data. And then there are the external data sets that are used by applications, by big data applications, and uh, we must uh, make sure that those uh, data, this data is trustworthy. So the, the data sources, first of all, must uh, ensure the integrity of the data that uh, they provide, and there must, must be methods to, uh, to make sure that these data sources are trustworthy and that we can trust them. And uh, then the channel that through which data is uh, transferred must again be secure. There must be no manipulation. There must be no eavesdropping. There must be no uh, no kind of uh, no kind of uh, interception in uh, in these uh, in these channels. And of course, you understand that the stakes uh, are huge. Imagine uh, a data set of all the health medical records in the world, and the, one could say that uh, there are simple ways to protect uh, valuable and big data sets. Uh, you can just close the gates, you can uh, not uh, allow uh, almost anyone to get access to these uh, data sets, but then there will be no big data industry, there will be no applications that can make use of this uh, huge value that is uh, that is uh, out there for this, uh, with this, with this data set. So we must uh, protect the data, but we must do it in a way that we can let the applications uh, thrive. Uh, this is uh, uh, the value of the big data industry. And that is why security is, data security is uh, so important and uh, together so complicated. Uh, the importance of this problem is uh, acknowledged in, uh, all over the world. The CASO project is looking at uh, the EU and the US sectors particularly, and we have uh, put together an opportunity report where we show, where we have uh, listed, uh, we have charted the opportunities that around big data that uh, you can find in the EU and the US. And, uh, in this report, you can find uh, the strategies that the EU and the US are following, and you can very Nikos? clearly see that. Uh, yes? Nikos? Yes. Uh, um, back, back to the, the previous slide, there, there was. Uh, uh, you, you, you caused some interaction. Uh, uh, from Doria, there were. Uh, Avri Doria, there were some questions about uh, how does this relate to. Uh, uh, environmental problems of oil, in a way. So, uh, the user expectations, how are they defined? Can you shortly comment on that before you go to the next slide? Sure, sure, I see it now, thanks. How are user expectations defined on, on these attributes? Well, of course, the users want to have the best uh, that uh, they, they, can, uh, they can get. And this changes day by day as the, the data sets becomes, uh, become uh, Wider now the definition on when uh, a data set, if this is a question, is considered big across this attribute, is uh, when uh, it cannot be handled by today's IT infrastructure. 
So uh, the, this, the industry, the big data industry, industry, what is crucial for the big data industry now is to create uh, technologies and applications that can make it possible for systems to make use of these huge data sets. Because uh, now the data sets are there, but we cannot uh, make use of them because uh, the systems are not uh, fast enough, they're not distributed enough, they're not secure enough. There are several problems that need to be solved so that uh, so this is why they are using these different uh, attributes. Uh, now the other question says, when big data is compared to oil, are all the environmental problems of oil included in the metaphor? <laughs> uh, I haven't thought of it uh, in this way, but uh, uh, clearly uh, when uh, oil is uh, also useful and it can also be harmful. Data sets, huge data sets are also very useful, but they can also be harmful if they are not used in the correct way and uh, if they are not controlled in the way that they should be controlled. And this is why security is very important uh, there. As I said before, it must be made available to processes and people that uh, uh, should have access and in the way that they should have access. It's not a, an easily solved problem, of course, you understand. Um, I hope I have addressed your questions. Uh, if not, please follow up. And then getting back to what I was saying is that this uh, huge importance is acknowledged uh, very widely in the strategies in the EU and the, in the, in the U e US. If you see, if you go to this opportunity report, which can be downloaded uh, from the Picasso website, uh, you can get access to all the references where a few charts that I'm going to show you are coming from. And uh, you see that in the EU big data strategy, they have identified uh, a lot of regulatory issues that are very relevant, security, ownership, personal data protection, and consumer protection. Uh, then in the US, again, several, uh, each column comes from a different uh, priority set in the US. From uh, NIST, uh, uh, first of all, the, the big data priorities, you see defense very high up, then from uh, the NSF, uh, the Secure Cyberspace, from the Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, National Security, and then Cyber Security and Privacy. So in the US, in all bodies that are dealing with the, with the priorities, uh, the security and uh, cyber security are very high up in the, in the agenda, which shows the acknowledgement and also shows the opportunities that are out there for every one of us that is uh, doing uh, research in these areas. And uh, summing up in this opportunity report, we have analyzed all these documents and all these reports and we have tried to create those, uh, these graphs showing uh, where the security, where each uh, priority and uh, the application sector, actually the headings are uh, opposite in these two slides, the previous one is about application sectors. So which ones have been identified as uh, more critical uh, or less critical in the US and the EU? And in the middle, we saw, we see security and uh, data protection and privacy identified as uh, most critical. And this information, this is our graph, but this information comes from analyzing all the documents uh, which are uh, referenced in the opportunity report, as I uh, said. I think I have used more of my time, so if there are no more questions, maybe Martin, we should go on to the next. Thank you very much, uh, Nikos. Uh, again, uh, this, these reports uh, uh, and more will be published also on the Picasso site. Uh, and and uh, thank you for your, your impression also of where you're looking for, for future work. Uh, I'd like to uh, move for the sake of time, there's no hands up, to uh, Christian to talk about uh, IoT CPS. Um, uh, Nikos, thanks. And uh, if you can stay, then uh, more questions may come later. Thank you. Sure, of course. Christian. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Perfect, thanks. So my name is Christian Sonntag, I'm from TU Dortmund in Germany. I'm the manager of the Picasso Expert Group on IoT and CPS that is chaired by Sebastian Engel from TU Dortmund and Tariq Samad from University of Minnesota. 
And I'd like to give a brief overview of how we or I see cyber how cyber security relates to our domain, technical domain. So first of all, uh, just a brief overview again. The Internet of Things has been talked about a lot already. So as you probably all know, um, this is going to be a huge market in the future. It's a real hype topic at the moment. So the market is going to be in the trillions. Um, yeah, lots of initiatives focusing on the uh, IoT. In the US, for example, you have numerous industry-led alliances with international memberships. For us, the most important one of these is the Industrial Internet Consortium, which I'll get to in a second, why this is important for us. On the European side, the Commission is also very much invested in this. You have the IoT initiative and the European IoT Research and Innovation Cluster. Um, on the other hand, we are looking at cyber physical systems. So these are technical systems where you have a tight interaction of cyber elements and physical elements. So you have a very much a physical domain, uh, a physical relationship in your system. So some examples of cyber physical systems that we are looking at are like airplanes, cars, ships, buildings, but also manufacturing plants, power plants, and these kinds of systems. Um, the features of these systems are they have many interacting components. Some examples, which are quite large, of course, are industrial sites with many production units, but also large networks of systems. We're talking about traffic networks, electricity networks, water, water distribution networks, and many more. And you have what is key compared to the traditional view of IoT, for example, is that we have physical connections. Uh, this is definitely an area of European strength. Uh, we have quite a big market in this area in Europe. Uh, we have four million jobs worldwide, one quarter of which are in Europe. Uh, so the IoT is a vast topic. So we decided we're not going to look at the whole scope of the IoT, but we're going to focus on a specific aspect of the IoT, um, which is how can you actually use the data that is generated by the IoT um, to create information and actions to control cyber physical systems. So what benefits can be gained from the data? And how can you actually get from the sensors to the actuators when you get lots of cheap um, sensing devices, IoT connected devices? And how can you actually close the loop in these systems? Um, so we here view now IoT as an enabling technology for CPS, which we call IoT enabled CPS, um, where we try to figure out what needs to be done to actually use all of this data to make the future version of cyber physical systems more efficient and uh, more safe. We had another um, support action project, CPSOS, that actually focused on these kinds of systems. Uh, cyber physical systems, which are often embedded in large systems consist consisting of many coupled components. And some of these components have partial autonomy. We call those cyber physical systems of systems. So if you go to this website, you can actually download our roadmap uh, that we've developed in this project where we're looking at what are the major challenges over the next 10 years for these large systems. And the systems we mean here are like power grids, oil and gas pipelines, commercial buildings, transportation networks, large production sites, but also all kinds of other complex essential critical infrastructures. Um, for these systems in Picasso, uh, we have identified quite a lot of technology challenges. Um, which you can also find in the opportunity report that Nikos already mentioned. You can simply go to the Picasso website. You can download it under project reports. So I just want to make some advertisement for that again. So in there, for all of the technology sectors, but also for policy, uh, we have identified what are the priorities in the Euro European Union and the US. How do they compare? What are gaps? What are technology themes? that we have to look at or uh, that should be looked at in collaboration actions, what are opportunities for collaboration and what are barriers. So if you're interested in this, download this report which we've uh, recently published. Um, regarding cybersecurity, um, so in the previous talks, a lot of people have already talked about what are the general issues, cybersecurity issues when you talk about the IoT, but generally also ICT systems. And I think that most or all of them actually also apply to the kind of systems that we are looking at. Um, I'll just try to give a brief overview what I see is um, the highest importance for the specific kind of systems, these IoT-enabled cyber-physical systems that we're looking at. So the first one, the important is 
one important issue here is that we have these physical connections. So if you have a security breach, then this will not only relate to the cyberspace, which it can be, um, which can also be drastic, of course. But here, if you have a security breach, that can actually have drastic physical, financial, and human consequences. So we're talking about things like large-scale power outages, chemical spills, congestion accidents, malfunctioning medical devices. So these are actually essential infrastructures that can be affected by cyber security breaches. But also cyber, cyber attacks can, in these systems, there's another complication that these cyber attacks can actually be possibly used to mask physical attacks and vice versa, but also exer exacerbate these attacks. So these are quite serious consequences. The second issue is that these are really large-scale systems usually, and you have numerous points of vulner vulnerability. People have been talking about this before. So in these kinds of systems, you have, of course, industrial components, but you also have non-industrial components. You have all kinds of sensors, networks, repositories, analytics engines, actuation devices, uh, HMIs. And in these systems, if, if they're not segmented in a way, overall security may depend on the weakened link, but um, this also obviously has an effect um, on the wider public because badly secured systems may have adverse effects on the cyber infrastructure. For example, if we talk about DDS, DDoS attacks. So Martin and the others have been talking about this before. So what we found, we've also did an analysis related to CPS and IoT. Um, what, um, how important the cyber security aspect currently is, and we found that it's actually now the dominant topic for IoT and CPS in both the U EU and the US. And it's probably be will become even more important over the next years. So it's a really important topic. Um, also, in the area of trust, which we found is mostly used in, in the European Union, and trustworthiness, worthiness, which is more a, t a term that's from the US, in my experience. Um, some policy changes, uh, challenges. Uh, one is. Many IoT enable CPS cross national boundaries if you think about large infrastructures. Um, and there you can be lots lots of policy, legal, and jurisdiction issues that people have been talking about before in this um, webinar. And I think there's a need for policy alignment across national boundaries regarding data access, cybersecurity regulations, and privacy. Um, IoT enabled CPS are multi stakeholder systems. Um, like other IoT systems also. But here, if you think, for example, about an industrial system, when you go from a sensor to an actuator via lots of different systems, all of these systems have been built by different companies, different co suppliers, and different operators are actually interacting with these systems. And here you have a really important challenge. If you think about separation of data, data ownership, also liability um, in case of attacks, who is responsible, how can you actually legally um, 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 how can you legally make sure that this can be dealt with? Tracing and combating attacks across multi-stakeholder systems and networks is a big topic here. Um, the third issue is something that has Dr. Faber especially has been talking about before. Um, we've also found in discussions that innovation pressure in the IT sector and legacy systems integration is a big, big issue. So for one thing, there are some systems that are now simply connected to the internet, although they were never designed for that. There's no real security framework present in many systems. They're just connected. If you think of like, if you think about Stuxnet, um, there are industrial control systems that were then connected to the internet but weren't actually prepared for this, so were quite easy to exploit or other um, instances. Um, in the IT sector, we found the time to market is more important than reliability. And frameworks for security certification are a big issue. For example, this trusted IoT initiative. Um, in what we also found is that cybersecurity and privacy are very sensitive topics when we discuss with experts, so co collaboration may actually be quite difficult to set up between the EU and the US. And I think that's all that I had. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Any specific questions to Christian at this point? 
Uh, please raise your hand. I see oh, Dave no, well, I just wanted to suggest sorry. there's a good uh, Dave, did you have public a question? reference You're document microphone? on IoT uh, issues put out by BITAG, B-I-T-A-G dot org. It's a, a not-for-profit group uh, that does some um, studies, uh, usually aimed at governmental decision-making. But take a look at it. It's uh, put together by some very good people, highly technical. Well, thank you very much. I wasn't aware of that one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Uh, the, there was also a, a, a report from a security and IoT group uh, workshop in, in Brussels that is interesting. Um, and there's also a, a recent uh, report from the NTIA in, in the US uh, on uh, policies relating to IoT. Uh, I think we'll make sure that uh, these links will be reflected in the, yeah. the, the, the final report on uh, security issues here. We can do that, right? Good. Uh, I see Stephen Asking the question, because IoT devices cross global industry and suppliers domain, the core issue is one of the uh, common secure standard. The risk uh, is that all eggs are in one basket. Well, Dave, I would like, love to give that to you. And because IoT devices cross global industry and suppliers domains, the core issue is one of the but, um, common secure standards. I'm not sure that's the quite the problem with IoT. I think there's basket. just too many suppliers of eggs and some of them get rotten. Basically, they're out of date. <laughs> uh, I, um, um, I think also it's a quite general a question. question. I think it's a general IoT problem and I would also agree um, with, with what Dr. Faber just said. So, it's all eggs in one basket, that's correct. It's a big risk as well, I think. No. Nikos, any last remark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's both, both the fact that it's uh, the limited number of baskets, it's the, the, the limitation of uh, yeah, what governments can do to protect you because they're local. And it's uh, the rotten eggs in the basket that uh, are so deep in the basket that nobody can yep. take them out. They'll be there forever. I guess that we was have the that Dave's uh, argument in, in the beginning. Already in large so, number of Wi-Fi routers, yep. which are, uh, have a lot of rotten eggs in them, and it potentially could cause us a nightmare of problems. And there are many fewer that, of those than there will be of IOTs. Yes, and uh, there is a lot of uh, complexity that makes it more difficult to to ensure security as well. And the complexity is deepened one by the fact we have many generations that, of on solutions. One final comment. The uh, other problem is a lot of these uh, devices are sold that. and the manufacturer goes huh? away. So there's Please. never any maintenance and there's no way for the user to, to maintain them. Yeah, and I, I would almost leave to the final, yeah, well, final uh, yes. comment with Stephen. He uh, says, the perfect act would be great until we find a problem with device. it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry that the time flies so fast. Um, uh, and thank you for your attention. Uh, this is not the last opportunity to interact with uh, Picasso and, and the knowledge we developed. Marta, can I give you the word for, to, to tell a bit more of how people can access more information? So, after this, feel free to send me emails personally. you find my email in the, the front yes. of the chat. Uh, or okay, to thank you. Thank you so much, website. Martin. Uh, it Marta, was a really interesting so discussion, more. of course. Uh, too many things. To, to say in this matter and too many things uh, also open that open uh, 
to further discussion. So uh, those uh, things, as well as research assessment and and uh, commerci commercialization opportunities, also and and of course the policy issues that arise up uh, that rise up in information and communication technologies are going to be uh, the main purposes and main objective to discuss during the transatlantic symposium that uh, Picasso is going to organize in June this June uh, in the 19 and in the 20 uh, in Minneapolis uh, hosted by the Technological Leadership in Institute of the University of Minnesota. You can find more information about how to register the agenda and all the speakers that are going to, to uh, participate during this symposium within our website that you can see is www.picasso-project.eu. As well as I want also to uh, inform you about the Picasso Crossroads, our new service that was uh, actually uh, launched a few weeks ago, uh, which is free of charge and gives more information about um, access opportunities and, and uh, finding more information about projects, uh, networks, as well as uh, ex existing collaborative initiatives and, and open calls within EU and US in order to facilitate the collaboration uh, uh, within the three technological domains focus uh, within uh, Picasso, which are big data, uh, IoT and CPS, and 5G. So thank you to all. Uh, you can see uh, Martin has uploaded the, the project another time in the chat. Uh, another uh, brief information for you, all the presentation, the recordings, and of course the validated policy brief uh, will be sent to all the registered participants. So um, from my side, it's all. And I want to let Martin close <laughs> and say thank you to all. So thank you also for for have been participating here. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, the next uh, call will be about uh, standards in this same context. I really appreciate also the input from my colleagues from 5G, uh, IoT and Big Data and all of you for your interest and uh, interaction. Uh, please know that we are very open to further interaction and we are very willing to share everything we've learned. So thank you everybody and wishing you a great morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. And night wherever you thank are. Thank you. Bye. All the best.